The kind of things that can get you in trouble on, on a campus these days um, would be hysterical if they weren't so tragic. Hi, I'm Ted Balaker with Reason TV, and today I'll be speaking with Greg Lukianoff. Lukianoff is president of FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. Briefly, what is the, the mission of FIRE? Uh, FIRE was founded back in 1999 to defend and sustain uh, individual rights on college campuses. Uh, primary among those is freedom of speech, but also we work with academic freedom, uh, due process, freedom of association, etc. But I'd say the majority of our work is, is freedom of speech work. The idea of the university is so noble, the free marketplace of ideas and so on. What's the reality of, of the university environment these days? Uh, prior to working at FIRE, if you were to tell me that I would deal with cases that are absurd and outrageous, um, dealing with censorship on campus, I, I probably wouldn't have believed you. Because I knew there was a problem, certainly, in the 90s, that political correctness and a desire to shut up people with um, uh, offensive opinions uh, was there. Uh, that, was, that was obvious to me. But the idea that it's, it's as bad as it is, um, it, I have to actually, I've been working at FIRE now for nine years. And the kind of cases that come in, um, the, the kind of things that can get you in trouble on, on a campus these days, um, would be hysterical if they weren't so tragic. Um, universities have to have the utmost respect for freedom of speech. They have to be able to, um, I, I think in, in Yale's own language it says, it has to allow you to mention the unmentionable and think the unthinkable. While at the same time at Yale, uh, j just this past year, the student government voted for a t-shirt making fun of Harvard that quoted F. Scott Fitzgerald. The quote was, in my opinion, all Harvard men are sissies. The full quote is, comma, like I used to be. But they took the, in my opinion, all Harvard men are sissies. I put it on a t-shirt with, we agree. Then this is for the Yale-Harvard football game. And, you know, uh, a, a little nerdy, a little highbrow, um, using a really anachronistic word that very few people take seriously. And because one student claimed that this was actually a slur, that sissy was actually a slur, um, they banned the students from actually having, a, once again, F. Scott Fitzgerald, um, uh, quote, at a school that promises that you should be allowed to think the unthinkable and mention the unmentionable, F. Scott Fitzgerald was a bridge too far. That very same year, um, a author was trying to publish a book called The Cartoons That Shook, Shook the World through Yale University Press. It's a book about the Muhammad Car cartoons controversy. Just shortly before it actually came out, Yale University itself intervened and, per and decided that, th that the author could not have pictures of Muhammad in a book about the Muhammad cartoons. Any other really egregious cases that come to mind? Well, sure, there, there was a decision that was just handed down in a case that we've been involved with for years. This involves a student who was protesting a parking garage for environmental reasons. And when the university president found out about this, he called the, the student into his office to harangue him for writing this op-ed. So the student made a collage of uh, what, what the president had said. Um, the president had, had re pathetically referred to this parking garage as his legacy. So he made a collage call, uh, referring to it as the President Zachariah Memorial Parking Garage. Um, that showed smoke and asthma and bulldozers and all, what, all he thought, and he put it on Facebook. Um, they used this, the president used this as an excuse to kick the student out of school as a clear and present danger, the, the, the professor's own words. The good news is that the uh, court just found that because he denied the student's due process rights, the president can be held personally liable for damages against the student who did this. And this should actually, uh, this should serve as a warning to administrators across the country who think that they can, with impunity, punish speech they don't like. The law is incredibly clear, they can't. What is, what is it about these university administrators? They seem to be among the most spineless people in our <laughs> midst. Is it a self-selection thing where mm -hmm. they're attracted to this line of business or do they, are they created like once they enter that? What would be the horrible repercussions for them if they actually did stand up for, for free speech? Well, what's going on with administrators is, is a puzzle and it's very much a mixed bag. I, I completely have met uh, administrators who are actually good on these issues um, and I think the most of the administrators um, are actually just not being active enough to defend student rights. But then you have the one of the, one of the kinds of problem administrators you have are the crusaders. 
the, the ones that actually think that it's their job, as for example at University of Delaware, as residence life to save the souls and psyches of their students. All 7,000 students were subjected to what, they, what the resident life uh, called a treatment that was this completely comprehensive indoctrination program that included floor meetings in which you had to stand on one side of the room if you had one opinion on a political issue and one side if you had on the other, basically being a public shaming of students with the wrong points of view, and even creepier, where you had one-on-one, -on -one, mandatory one-on-one -on -one meetings with your RA to discuss what races and sexes you would date. Um, a female student who objected to this um, actually um, who, who said none of your damn business, she was written up for, for potential punishment. What is the big picture in all this? How many, roughly how many schools have speech codes? How, how bad is it in, in broad terms? This is actually good news. Of the nearly 300 schools that we rate, um, only 71% of them have what we call red light speech codes. Uh, that's laughably unconstitutional or, or would be uh, unconstitutional at a public college. Um, that's good news because in previous years, um, the ratings all done by the same person, we'd gotten as high as 79%. All of this, all of these speech codes are somewhat perversely done in the name of education, that teaching students how to be civil and teaching students how to, um, how to be respectful and tolerant. Um, the, but what you're miseducating students about is, uh, is about what their rights actually are. And when these speech codes are everywhere, you start talking to students and they just assume they can't have a controversial opinion. So they just avoid talking about controversial things in a lot of cases. Students are internalizing uh, the, the values of censorship as actually things that good people do. That, and I find that personally terrifying. And, there, and if you really understand what's at stake when you, when you limit freedom of speech, um, that when you understand that our entire intellectual system um, going far beyond just a scientific method depends on open exchange of ideas and, 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 and um, thought experiments, um, then you, you go there ready to battle not just the abuses of law, but the, but the, the, the weirdly warped mentality that puts censorship uh, on the side of the angels and free speech on the side of the devils. It's completely reversed. Are there any schools that consistently over the years defend free expression? Um, you know, it's funny. Uh, I, I usually would say um, uh, Penn State's been pretty good about it. Graham Spanier has been pretty good at Penn State. Um, but we're just releasing a video right now um, uh, about a case where uh, there was a student who was making art, a Jewish student was making art that was critical of radical Islam um, and talking about Palestinian terrorism against Israelis. Um, and his, uh, his art was was banned because a professor claimed it didn't foster democratic dialogue and that it violated the university code. It's, it, it's amazing how the mental gymnastics people have to do to, to, to justify censorship. Um, I was happy though that Graham Spanier became involved in the case quickly and said, no, 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 we're definitely gonna run this art. But then I found out that actually they never did. They publicly said that they would run the art and then they never did. And another school, I think, uh, uh, considered what was about to run it, but then they canceled it for, for the justification being for fear of terrorist reprisal when there'd been no threats against the art. It was actually a professor at Penn State University who just didn't like the politics of the student um, in, in this case. It, it can be really heartbreaking sometimes because um, freedom of speech is a beautiful idea. Um, and it does, uh, foster, in, in my opinion, uh, personal growth. And all you have to do is deal with the fact you're sometimes going to hear things that you think are ignorant or, or simply that challenge your worldview. And that's not, such a, that, that's not such a big price to pay, in my opinion.